Tesla is a hardcore tech company, not a car company. That's what was said during the dojo portion of Tesla's AI Day 2022. But in a bit of a twist, what I want to talk about in particular today is why dojo is so important from a software standpoint, or in other words, from a user standpoint. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So the dojo portion of the AI Day presentation was at the very end of the presentation, and it was also rather long. It's about 25 minutes or so long. So I've been trying to figure out how to break it up in an efficient way, and the way I wanna think about it is kind of from the user's standpoint. So I'm gonna gloss over a little bit of the details of the hardware and everything. Number one, you can watch the presentation, but number two, you can go back and you can watch my AI Day presentation from last year, AI day 2021. By the way, all of these things have been placed into one nice playlist for you. AI day one and AI day two are in my AI day playlist. So take a look at that. I'll put a link up here and I'll try to do that at the end, but I think I can only do videos at the end. So maybe I'll put a link to that in the description as well. But anyway, so you can get a better sense of Dojo's hardware and everything through that. But also Dave Lee interviewed James Dalma along with Farzad Mezbahi and Nicholas Gibbs, which is an awesome name, by the way. <laughs> I approve. But anyway, James goes into such an incredible amount of detail on the hardware that you might as well just watch his if you really, really want to get into the nitty gritty. So I am going to talk about the hardware because the hardware is super, super important. But what I want to do is kind of look at this from a user's perspective. Like I said, I want to look at this as if I was somebody working for Tesla or eventually when Tesla does AI as a service that I, as a, a normal user, if I want to send off a job to Tesla, what are the restrictions? What do I have to do? and how does it do all of this stuff under the hood to make working with Tesla from a software point of view really, really seamless. And actually from the still frame that I have up here right away, you can sort of see what's going on here. They call this a quote, sea of compute nodes. And each one of the little tiny yellowish squares is a D1 die chip. So that's one little section of it that has a whole bunch of processors on it and everything. But that's one little section. And then each five by five one, which is sort of broken apart by the sort of bigger dark line in between. Each of those is a dojo tile, and then those are all put together into an exapod. The big thing to remember about dojo's hardware is that we're talking a lot about bandwidth limited computing rather than compute limited computing. That's the most crucial thing to sort of keep in mind at a high level. I am not a supercomputer expert by any stretch of the imagination, so that's the way I kind of try to think about it. But I think this is a reasonable point of view to take. Essentially what goes on in my my personal computer here, like on my Apple M1 or something, is that if I'm running a really, really complicated thing, it's probably compute limited. In other words, it's just maxing out either the processor or the GPU or something like that, and it's running and running and running, and that's the limitation. But when you get to really, really large neural network models and things, the important aspect of it is that the communication of data back and forth from the compute nodes is very, very limiting. The compute nodes are super, super fast, but these models and and the data and everything is massive. And so in order for the computer to be able to use this, the supercomputer to be able to use this, it's spending most of its time waiting for data to be shuttled around. So what Tesla's done is they focused everything on bandwidth. They focused everything on communication, density of computing, physical density, where everything close by to each other so that things can get back and forth as fast as possible and very, very rapid data transmission and communication between nodes. That's the important critical aspect of what Dojo is done. And then on top of that, they've added an incredibly sophisticated compiler that makes this pretty much invisible to the user. And that's the other thing to keep track of. So we're going to go through the hardware aspect of it first, and I'm going to do that relatively rapidly. And then we're going to talk about the software aspect. But keep that in mind. What we're talking about is density of computing, bandwidth limitations, and the fact that we've got a compiler that essentially makes all of the ridiculously hard stuff that they're doing in hardware really, really transparent transparent to the end user. My name is Pete Bannon. I, I run the uh, custom silicon and low voltage teams at Tesla. Yeah. And my name is uh, Ganesh Venkat. I run the Dojo program. <laughs> Thank you. I'm frequently asked, why is a car company building a supercomputer for training? And this question fundamentally misunderstands uh, the nature of Tesla. 
At its heart, Tesla is a hardcore technology company. All across the company, people are working hard in science and engineering to advance the fundamental understanding and, and methods that we have available to build cars, energy solutions, robots, and anything else that we can, we, we can do to improve the human condition around the world. So I don't want to focus too long on this introduction because it's going to be a long enough video anyway. But what Pete is saying here is worth looking at for just a second. He's saying that Tesla is a hardcore tech company. They're not a car company. They're not a software company. They're not even a robotics company. They're a hardcore tech company. They're willing to do anything that they can to create products that will better humanity. And Dojo is one of those things. It's not going to touch consumers for a long, long time, if ever. I hope it does touch consumers in the sense of AI as a service eventually. I really do hope that they do that. But it's definitely going to affect us indirectly because this is the stuff that's going to allow Tesla to go from training things that take like a month to train to training those same size models in a day or two instead of a month. That's a huge, huge advantage and it changes the entire way that the software team and the AI team can think about large models and how fast they can train and what they can do with that. So this is critical. And I want to throw in here, I attempted to communicate with Elon Musk, but of course he doesn't know who I am. But basically their mission statement right now is accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy. I think I've got that approximately correct. And I suggested what they need to do is update their mission statement to accelerating the world's transition. And I think it's reasonable for them to cut this mission statement down at this point. They are just trying to accelerate the world's transition. They're trying to get the world to sort of world version 2.0 or something and change a bunch of fundamental things about the way that we all live. So of course, we'll see what Tesla comes up with, but I did think it was worth at least mentioning that. And I also just wanted to show this little piece of the intro because I think it's valuable to think about Tesla as much more than these little individual pieces and much more the overall thing that they are, which is gigantic and world-changing. It's a super exciting thing to be a part of, and it's a privilege to run a very small piece of it in the semiconductor group. Um, tonight, we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, Dojo and give you an update on what we've been able to do over the last year. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to give a little bit of background on the initial design uh, that we started a few years ago. When we got started, the goal was to provide a substantial improvement to the training latency for our autopilot team. Some of the largest neural networks they train today run for over a month, which inhibits their ability to rapidly explore alternatives and evaluate them. So, you know, a 30x speed up would be really nice if we could provide it at a cost competitive and energy competitive way. So it's worth breaking in here, even though this is still kind of more general talking, a 30X speed up would mean that you could go from taking a month to train a neural network from scratch. And again, I'm sure they do a lot of stuff to cheat that so they don't have to retrain the entire thing. In fact, I know they do that because they freeze parts of the neural network and only train small pieces. But basically, if they wanna retrain some of these larger networks from scratch, it's a month. And if you could do that in one day instead, that not only makes everything go faster, but it fundamentally changes the way you think about training. You can think about training in a much more kind of loosey-goosey, fail-fast sort of manner, rather than saying everything has to be perfect before you train it. So it would be a fundamental sea change to be able to make that sort of speed up happen. Um, to do that, we wanted to uh, build a chip with a lot of arithmetic, arithmetic units that we could utilize at a very high efficiency. And we spent a lot of time studying whether we could do that using DRAM various packaging ideas, um, all of which failed. And in the end, even though it felt like an unnatural act, we decided to reject DRAM as the primary storage medium for this system and instead focus on SRAM embedded in the chip. SRAM provides, unfortunately, a modest amount of capacity, but extremely high bandwidth and very low latency. And that enables us to achieve high utilization with the arithmetic units. So I'm gonna skip forward in the presentation after this point, but this is an absolutely critical piece of information to understand as we look at the rest of this. Essentially what they've done, the Dojo team has sacrificed memory and having lots and lots of memory in order to have high bandwidth and very, very high speed compute. And as far as I remember, the D1 chips, these little guys here that make up the actual tile itself, each one of those only has on the order of a couple of megabytes of memory, not gigabytes or things like that that we're used to. So they have sacrificed a massive amount of memory in order to have faster compute time. SRAM is a far, far faster memory architecture than DRAM, dynamic RAM. 
But the sacrifice is that you can't use as much of it. It's difficult to build, it's much more expensive, and it has to sit on the chip itself. It has to literally be right next to the compute nodes in order to operate at very, very high speed and transfer memory back and forth. So what they've done is they've made a major sacrifice. They've given up DRAM, which is really, you know, almost free at this point, it's not true, but you can get as much memory as you want if you're willing to pay money for it, but it's super, super slow, as in 10 times slower than SRAM or something along Along those lines. It's like an order of magnitude slower. So they're getting an order of magnitude speed up, but everything downstream in terms of the construction of the way that they're building Dojo flows from the fact that they gave up on DRAM and they're using SRAM instead. It goes into the hardware, the interconnects, the way the compiler operates, the ingest software, all of the pieces that we're going to talk about in this discussion flow from the very, very important, significant fact that they gave up the easy solution, which would be going with DRAM, and they went with SRAM instead. Uh, that particular choice led to a whole bunch of other choices. <clears throat> For example, if you want to have virtual memory, you need page tables. They take up a lot of space. We didn't have space, so no virtual memory. Uh, we also don't have interrupts. The accelerator is a bare bones, raw piece of hardware that's presented to a compiler, and the compiler is responsible for scheduling everything that happens in a deterministic way. So there's no need or even desire for interrupts in the system. We also chose to pursue uh, model parallelism as a training methodology, which is not the typical situation. Most, uh, most machines today use data parallelism, which consumes additional uh, memory capacity, which we obviously don't have. So all of those choices led us to build a machine that is pretty radically different uh, from what's available today. Um, we also had a whole bunch of other goals. One, one of the most important ones was no limits. So we wanted to build a compute fabric that would scale un, in an unbounded way for the most part. I mean, obviously, there's physical limits now and yeah. then. Um, but you know, pretty much if your model was too big for the computer, you're, you just had to go buy a bigger computer. Uh, that's what we were looking for. All right, so let's move on to the presentation itself. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Ganesh. Um, I'll start tonight with uh, a high-level vision of our system that will that will help set the stage for the, the challenges and the problems we're solving, and then also how software will then leverage this for performance. Our vision for Dojo is to build a single unified accelerator, a very large one. Software would see a seamless compute plane with globally addressable, very fast memory, and all connected together with uniform high bandwidth and low latency. Now, to realize this, we, we need to use density to achieve performance. Now, we leverage technology to get this density in order to break levels of hierarchy all the way from the chip to the scale out systems. All right, so let's take a look at this image here. So this is one dojo tile, and, and fascinatingly enough, they actually let you pick these things up. They had one sample tile that I assume was a dead tile or something anyway, but you could pick it up. I think it's 23 kilos or somewhere around 45 or 50 pounds, something along those lines. This thing is massively, massively heavy. It's about yay big, right? So the, the copper thing on top, the, the, the more goldish colored thing on top is about this big, but all of these layers together without any kind of water cooling or anything inside of it. They weigh a really, really big amount. So there is a lot of actual massive amount of weight that's pushed into this thing. And the reason why this is so 3D and so massive is because of the amount of power that's going into it. Essentially, the power comes in from the bottom of this. It rises up. And then when it gets to the part where you see the five by five sort of pinkish salmonish colored part, that's the part that's doing the computing. And then on top of that is a liquid cooling system. So it's energy in the bottom, get to the compute node, and then you have heat and you have to dissipate that heat. And all of this stuff has to happen in a very, very small amount of space. And then of course, what you do in the cabinets, and I got to see a cabinet too, which was really cool. Can't take pictures of them, but anyway, <laughs> I got to look inside the cabinet, it's awesome, is that there are three of these tiles going up and then another row of three. So there's basically six of these. And then if I'm remembering correctly, there's two rows of that and then a whole bunch of power supply underneath it. So basically you've got per cabinet, you've got 12 of these tiles, two racks of three by two tiles. 
and each tile has 25 D1 chips, which are the compute nodes that are going on. And so there's a massive amount of compute power going on. But more importantly than that, the reason they've stacked everything in a three-dimensional fashion is because what they've done is they've made everything as seamless as possible horizontally. So horizontal is data. Data goes in and out of these chips really, really quickly in the horizontal plane. The vertical plane is all about energy and cooling. Now, silicon technology has, has used this, has done this for decades. Uh, chips have followed Moore's law to, for density and integration to get perf uh, performance scaling. Now, a key step in realizing that vision was our training tile. Not only can we integrate 25 dies at extremely high bandwidth, but we can scale that to any number of additional tiles by just connecting them together. So this is the really important part here. You can grab a GPU from NVIDIA or another company if you want to, and you can stick it in your computer and you can run things. But as soon as your model gets bigger than that GPU can handle, you're dealing with bandwidth. You're dealing with communication between different GPUs or between diff different CPUs or between different actual computer boxes. And that's where, you know, you're looking at a 10X or 100X slowdown from the speed of your processor itself. So most of the time, right? So if you can do something in 10 seconds, but then it takes 10 minutes to wait for somebody else to do something, you're going to be spending most of your time just sitting around. And so that's what these processors are doing without enough bandwidth. They're just hanging around doing nothing and waiting for the next thing to happen. So you want a massive amount of bandwidth and everything that Tesla has done is to forefront the bandwidth and how fast things can get in and out of these chips. Now, last year we showcased our first functional training tile. And at that time, we already had workloads running on it. And since then, the team here has been working hard and diligently to deploy this at scale. Now, we've made amazing progress and had a lot of milestones along the way. And of course, we've had a lot of unexpected challenges. But this is where our fail fast philosophy has allowed us to push our boundaries. Now, pushing density for performance presents all new challenges. One area is power delivery. Here, we need to deliver the power to our compute die, and this directly impacts our top-line compute performance. But we need to do this at unprecedented density. We need to be able to match our die pitch with a power density of almost one amp per millimeter squared. And because of the extreme integration, this needs to be a multi-tiered vertical power solution. And because there's a complex heterogeneous material stack up, we have to carefully manage the material transition, especially CTE. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. And again, I'm gonna kind of gloss over this for the most part. The important thing is that as of sometime in 2022, it's not clear, but the last slide said that they were able to man manufacture one tile per day, which is really, really remarkable. So they're able to create these these cabinets and then eventually the exapod and everything at a relatively reasonable rate of speed. So again, as with everything else, Tesla is all about manufacturing things at a reasonable scale, right? They're not about making one car, they're about making a million cars. They're not about getting full self-driving working for one car, they're about making it work for millions of cars. They're not about making one Optimus, they're talking about making tens or hundreds of millions of Optimus robots. So the speed of production here is really, really important. But take a look at a couple of these things. Number one, high performance, a thousand amps are going into this thing. <laughs> this is an amazing amount of amperage. Very, very low voltage, James Dalma, says somewhere around 0.7 or 0.8 volts. So it's super low voltage, but really, really high amperage that's going into this stuff, which means you're going to be producing an awful lot of heat. And notice that also we've got a complex integration. What he's talking about is that all the layers in that earlier slide are made of different materials. And even you can see that in this particular image, this motherboard, the silicon, the, the you know capacitors, the whatever else is on there, all of those have different thermal rates of expansion. In other words, when you put heat onto them, they expand at different rates. And if you're not careful with a thousand amps going into this thing, it's producing a ton of heat. These things will all expand at slightly different amounts and the whole thing will crack apart and break. So this is the kind of stuff that happens when you go from relatively undense things to very, very dense things with heterogeneous materials and things like that. But in order to get the kind of bandwidth that you need to have this kind of supercomputing happen, you have to be able to work at these densities. We need to be able to match our die pitch with a power density of almost one amp per millimeter squared. 
And because of the extreme integration, this needs to be a multi-tiered vertical power solution. And because there's a complex heterogeneous material stack up, we have to carefully manage the material transition, especially CTE. Now, why does the coefficient of thermal expansion matter in this case? CTE is a fundamental material property. And if it's not carefully managed, that stack up would literally rip itself apart. So we started this effort by working with vendors to, deliver, to, to develop this power solution. But we realized that we actually had to develop this in-house. I just wanted to interrupt here very, very quickly. Notice that they say 14 versions in 24 months. So they have been iterating at an almost ridiculous level. They've almost got it to one iteration of this voltage regulator per month. And that's pretty insane. So this just shows you the kind of pace of progress that they're doing. Remember, this isn't software. This is hardware. This is little tiny bits of hardware that they're working on. And they're iterating on this almost at a rate of one iteration per month. So I just wanted to note that that's a really, really impressive number that they've got posted there. Now to balance schedule and risk, we built quick iterations to support both our system bring up and software development, and also to find the optimal design and stack up that would meet our final production goals. And in the end, we were able to reduce CTE over 50% and meet our performance by 3x over, over our initial version. Now needless to say, finding this optimal material stack up while maximizing performance at density is extremely difficult. So this, of course, would go back to Tesla's fail fast methodology and SpaceX's too. Basically build these things, fail, learn from it, build something else, fail, learn from it. Don't put in a ton of research and effort into the first version of it. Just assume that you're going to break it and figure out the next thing. I'm going to skip over the next section, which has to do with some of the cool stuff that they learned about, including singing capacitors and stuff. So definitely continue watching it on Tesla's AI Day presentation if you're interested. And I'm also going to skip over some stuff about the infrastructure, cooling things, and all of the incredible work that they've put in to creating not just individual tiles, but entire cabinets and the rooms that they're in and all of the cooling needs that have to go on with this. This stuff is all super, super impressive, but this video would be forever long if I go through everything. So by all means, feel free to check out the original AI Day presentation. Of course, I will leave a link to that in the description. Now, last year, we introduced only a couple of components of our system, the custom D1 die and the training tile but we tease the exit pod as our end goal. We'll walk through the remaining parts of our system that are required to build out this exit pod. Now the system tray is a key part of realizing our vision of a single accelerator. It enables us to seamlessly, seamlessly connect tiles together, not only within the cabinet, but between cabinets. We can connect these tiles at very tight spacing across the entire accelerator, and this is how we achieve our uniform communication this is a laminated bus bar that allows us to integrate very high power, mechanical and thermal support, and an extremely dense integration. It's 75 millimeters in height and, and supports six tiles at 135 kilograms. This is the equivalent of three to four fully loaded high performance racks. Next, we need to feed data to the training tiles. This is where we've developed the Dojo interface processor. So again, going back to bandwidth here, this bottom part of this slide, which says 32 gigabyte high bandwidth DRAM, 900 terabytes per second TTP bandwidth, 50 gigabytes per second ethernet bandwidth, 32 gigabytes per second gen four PCIe bandwidth. All of those things refer to an immense amount of data throughput in and out of these chips. So note that the 32 gigabytes of high bandwidth DRAM is DRAM here as opposed to SRAM. So that is your standard kind of memory. That's the sort of memory that you have if you have a 32 gigabyte computer at home or something, obviously at a much higher level of performance, but the same kind of thing. But that memory is significantly slower than SRAM, which is the stuff that they're using on the D1 chips. And so what you have to do is you have to feed the information from the DRAM. So if you imagine that's like a gigantic pool of water or something, and you're 
your SRAM is just this little thing that's like working really fast. It's the river where it's flowing. So that's the waterfall where you're performing all of the work, but the massive reservoir of water up above, that's the DRAM that you've got. So by limiting the chips themselves to SRAM, they're only able to hold a tiny bit in there. Basically it's what's happening in the waterfall. So they're using it for compute very, very rapidly, but they have to be able to access larger amounts of memory as they're needed kind of on demand. And that's really, really hard to do. So that requires immense amounts of very, very high bandwidth performance out of their hardware and also some really clever software tuning as well. It provides our system with high bandwidth DRAM to stage our training data. And it provides full memory bandwidth to our training tiles using TTP, our custom protocol that we use to communicate across our entire accelerator. It also has high-speed Ethernet that helps us extend this custom protocol over standard Ethernet. And we provide native hardware support for this with little to no software overhead. And lastly, we can connect, connect to it through a standard Gen 4 PCIe interface. Now, we pair 20 of these cards per tray, and that gives us 640 gigabytes of high bandwidth DRAM. And this provides our disaggregated memory layer for our training tiles. These cards are a high bandwidth ingest path, both through PCIe and Ethernet. They also provide a high rate X Z connectivity path that allow shortcuts across our large dojo accelerator. So again here, it's worth noting the high rate X Z plane connectivity. I'm not sure, but I believe Z in their parlance is the up axis. I always use it as Y because Maya defaults to that, but I believe that's the vertical axis. So essentially they're able to sort of cheat by moving upward through instead of having to go sort of horizontally as you might think of it. I believe that's what they're talking about with their shortcuts across the compute plane. Anyway, however that works, it's really, really cool because basically they're able to hop to where they need to go on hardware instead of having to take the long path. Now we actually integrate the host directly underneath our system tray. These hosts provide our ingest processing and connect to our interface processors through PCIe. These hosts can provide hardware video decoder support for video-based training. And our user applications land on these hosts that we, so we, we can provide them with a standard x86 Linux environment. Okay, so this point is really, really important here. Essentially what they're saying is that they've got a standard interface to the outside world. That, that this last step is the interface to the outside world. And essentially that means that users can treat this as a basic bog standard Linux desktop computer. That's a really, really important point. And we're gonna get back to that when we get to hardware in just a minute. Now we can put two of these assemblies into one cabinet and pair it with redundant power supplies that do direct conversion of three-phase 480-volt AC power to 52-volt DC power. Now, by focusing on density at every level, we can realize the vision of a single accelerator. Now, starting with the uniform nodes on our custom D1 die, we can connect them together in our fully integrated training tile, and then finally, seamlessly connecting them across cabinet boundaries to form our Dojo Accelerator. And altogether, we can house two full accelerators in our Exapod for a combined one exaflop of ML compute. Now, altogether, this amount of technology and integration has only ever been done a couple of times in the history of compute. Next, we'll see how software can leverage this to accelerate their performance. So we've more or less talked about all of this stuff already, but basically the idea here again is that you're able to seamlessly attach all of these things. The whole point of creating Dojo was to create something that could continuously grow and get bigger and bigger without any bottlenecks. So essentially this is like a Lego of compute power. So you have a tile, you put another, well actually you have a D1 chip, you add the D1 chips together, you create a tile, you add the tile to another tile, you add the tile to another tile, then you put that in a cabinet, then you add that cabinet to another cabinet and another cabinet, and the whole deal is not to have your performance slow down. You want to have it continue growing as you add more compute nodes, and that's the whole point of why this high density, high bandwidth, low memory, focused supercomputer is what they've pushed with Dojo. And as he says, this hasn't been done a whole lot of times. In fact, actually, you know, Cray back in the early days when they built the first 
first supercomputers were one of the few that actually built these things from the ground up to be kind of this massive compute thing. Most supercomputers these days are created by more or less off the shelf racks of GPUs. That's essentially what they are. And they work fantastically and they have a lot of really, really cool stuff that goes on under the hood to make it work, but they're kind of off the shelf in that sense. So creating this all from scratch to be infinitely tileable more or less is a very, very different thing that harkens back to the early days of computing and supercomputing. Thanks, Bill. My name is Rajiv, and I'm gonna talk some numbers. So our software stack begins with the PyTorch extension that speaks to our commitment to run standard PyTorch models out of the box. So I'm gonna stop this right now by just pointing out that they have a PyTorch extension for Dojo, which essentially means that from a user standpoint, you can just use PyTorch, which is one of the two standard neural network training architectures that's out there. There's TensorFlow and there's PyTorch. Those are the two biggies. And of course, Tesla has gone with PyTorch very famously. Andre Carpathia is a big fan of PyTorch. So anyway, they've got this thing built out so that you basically can just take your standard PyTorch code, you can take these PyTorch neural networks and you can just shove them into Dojo and it just works. Now, obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of optimization and things like that that you can do to make it work better. But the really important point here is that it runs without modification. And that's actually proven by the fact that they're able to run Stable Diffusion, which had only come out a couple of weeks before this presentation. That's the really cool software that's able to make things like images from text, right? Similar to Dolly 2. But they were able to download this from GitHub, run the code, and it worked on their Dojo chips. So that's really, really, really super impressive. And it not only clears the decks and makes it really, really easy for Tesla's internal software developers to use. But it also makes it very, very reasonable that AI as a service someday could be quite a reasonable potential. In other words, that's the kind of thing where I as a researcher could say, here's this really, really large neural network model that I can't train conveniently on whatever it is that I've got available to me. I can just send it off to them, they can run it, and then they can send me back the results. That's the kind of thing that you could do with AI as a service. And that that is super, super facilitated by just having a standard PyTorch interface where you don't have to do an awful lot of recoding or anything like that to make it work. That makes it much more convenient, not only for Tesla's engineers, but also for any engineers on the outside who will eventually use this. So that's the really, really critical part of this entire presentation for me is that everybody can use this. You don't have to do anything special. All of the back end work that they have done, immense, immense amounts of work on hardware and on software on the compiler, everything else is just so that a person sees a gigantic computer with an infinite amount of memory, more or less, and they can just run stuff on it and they don't have to worry about what's going on under the hood. We're going to talk more about our JIT compiler and the ingest pipeline that feeds the hardware with data. Abstractly, performance is tops times utilization times accelerator occupancy. We've seen how the hardware provides peak performance. It's the job of the compiler to extract utilization from the hardware while code is running on it. And it's the job of the ingest pipeline to make sure that data can be fed at a throughput high enough for the hardware to not ever starve. So the utilization here comes down to the compiler. The compiler for Dojo has to be an immensely optimized compiler. It's not your standard compiler that just runs on any old hardware. It has to do a huge amount of work because of the fact that Dojo's D1 chips have very, very little memory. That means that the compiler has to be able to put things in order exactly as the compute nodes are going to need them. So they don't need extra memory and they don't have to do things out of order or anything like that. And then that of course comes down to the accelerator accelerator occupancy in the ingest pipeline where the compiler has to pull things in in the right order at the right speed so it arrives just in time. So this is all really, really immensely complicated stuff. And the goal, and it seems like they've achieved this, is to make it invisible to the end user. So what Rajiv is talking about here is just immense amounts of work. And you'll never see it on the outside. It'll just seem like it's really easy and no big deal. But this is huge and the reason why Dojo is going to be so good at what it does. So let's talk about why communication-bound models are difficult to scale. But before that, let's look at why ResNet 50-like models are easier to scale. You start off with a single accelerator, run the forward and backward passes, followed by the optimizer. Then to scale this up, you run multiple copies of this on multiple accelerators. And while the gradients produced by the backward pass do need to be reduced, and this introduces some communication, this can be done pipeline with the backward pass. This setup scales fairly well, almost linearly. 
So with a ResNet model, which is a relatively small model, and it's, geez, <laughs> it's only 10 years old. And by the by, I mentioned recently, I think I misspoke in one of my videos where I said an ImageNet model. I did not mean that. I meant AlexNet slash ResNet type of model. And a lot of people took me to task about that. So sorry about misspeaking. ImageNet is a giant collection of images that are labeled and it's really good to train on. AlexNet and ResNet type models are the types of models that train on this and do very well at classification. But anyway, ResNets nowadays are relatively small models so you can kind of fit each one so again if you imagine you have a whole bunch of gpus like maybe you have eight gpus you can fit a part of the resnet model or a part of the batch like if you have a batch of eight images you can put one image on each gpu that would be really excessive anyway but it's just a for instance but basically what you can do is you can run each one of the batches on an individual gpu and then combine them all together at the end and so you can really really parallelize something like resnet well because it's a relatively small model but what happens when you get a model that's so big that it doesn't conveniently fit on a GPU, or at least a batch of them don't fit on a GPU? For models with much larger activations, we run into a problem as soon as we want to run the forward pass. The batch size that fits in a single accelerator is often smaller than the batch norm surface. So to get around this, researchers typically run the setup on multiple accelerators in sync batch norm mode. This introduces latency-bound communication to the critical path of the forward pass and we already have a communication bottleneck. So note here that batch normalization is specifically called out on the left-hand side with the text. That's a part of many neural networks where what you have to do is you have to combine all of the data together to normalize it. Normalization just means taking like all of the values and kind of compressing them down to a zero to one range. So if you had some values that were like 45, like some of the weights were like 45 and others were negative 1,000 or something like that, it compresses that down. It does it in a relatively clever way, but you could imagine something like just dividing by the largest number and subtracting or something to get them all between zero and one. Anyway, they take account of standard deviations and all of this other kind of stuff. But the important part is that you have to have not just the individual image or something, but the whole batch. And so generally when you're training, you'll train on batches of, you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000 or something like that. You have to fit all of that stuff into memory and it's not going to fit in memory if it's a large model and a big batch. And so what you have to do then is get all of that data and combine it together and then then let one compute node kind of chunk on that for a while and then spread all of that data back out again. It's incredibly inefficient, like again, 10 to 100 times slower than basic compute. So every time you have a batch norm in a big model like this, you're going to have massive, massive slowdowns. So this is one really obvious place where having really, really high speed communication between the nodes is super, super valuable. And what does Dojo do? It focuses on high speed communication. For models with much larger activations, we run into a problem as soon as we want to run the forward pass. The batch size that fits in a single accelerator is often smaller than the <clears> batch norm <throat> surface. So to get around this, researchers typically run the setup on multiple accelerators in sync batch norm mode. This introduces latency-bound communication to the critical path of the forward pass, and we already have a communication bottleneck. And while there are ways to get around this, they usually involve tedious manual work best suited for a compiler. And ultimately, there's no skirting around the fact that if your state does not fit in a single accelerator, you can be communication bound. And even with significant efforts from our ML engineers, we see such models don't scale linearly. So if you remember that last graph that was linear, essentially if you have two compute nodes and you go to four, you get double the compute power or some exact percentage more. And then if you have from four to eight, you get that percentage more, et cetera, et cetera. Here you can see there's a definite tail off, especially as we get above eight compute nodes, it really starts to tail off, which means that you're expending a great deal of energy, not just constructing this, but also running these things with 64 nodes. And you're not getting a lot of bang for the buck out of it, right? So you're spending a huge amount, you're doubling the cost of your compute thing. In fact, more than that, because you have energy and you have cooling and all of that kind of stuff. But going from 32 to 64 nodes, you don't get that much compute power out of it because it's so bandwidth constrained. The Dojo system was built to make such models work at high utilization. The high density integration is, was built to not only accelerate the compute bound portions of a model, but also the latency bound portions like a batch norm or the bandwidth bound portions like a gradient all reduce or a parameter all gather. A slice of the dojo mesh can be carved out to run any mo model. The only thing users need to do is to make the slice large enough to fit a batch room surface for their particular model. After that, the partition presents itself as one large accelerator. 
freeing the users from having to worry about the internal details of execution. And it's the job of the compiler to maintain this abstraction. Fine-grained synchronization primitives and uniform low latency makes it easy to accelerate all forms of parallelism across integration boundaries. Tensors are usually stored sharded in SRAM and replicated just in time for layers execution. We depend on the high dojo bandwidth to hide this replication time. Tensor replication and other data transfers are overlap with compute, and the compiler can also recompute layers when it's profitable to do so. So there is a lot going on here, but essentially what he's talking about here is that the user does not see all the complexity. Essentially, the memory is sharded out, which means it's just separated into little bits and things so that it's all set up properly. It's all fed in. The whole thing is synchronized in what James Dowman called a symphony, which I think is actually a beautiful way of thinking about it. So you can think about all the different instruments creating one beautiful sound in a symphony. What you've got going on here is all of the components, the memory, the energy, the compute power, the bandwidth going back and forth between these things, all of that kind of stuff is operating in perfect synchronization to create a symphony of computing. And the user just sees one big giant computer. It's as big as you need, right? Essentially what you do is you start your job and you go like, how much do I need? So I've got this big of a model and I want to train this many samples of it, this, meant this much in a batch. And therefore you can kind of essentially multiply it out and you can sort of go like, okay, this is how much I'm going to need. And you just ask for that amount and Dojo figures it all out in the compiler, puts it into memory, puts it into hardware, computes the thing and pops it back out again. And you don't have to worry about it as a user, which of course is why I said I was gonna focus on the end user in this presentation, because it's so cool to think about how easy the team has made it for software users. We expect most models to work out of the box. As an example, we took the recently released stable diffusion model and got it running on Dojo in minutes. Out of the box, the compiler was able to map it in a model parallel manner on 25 dojo dies. Here are some pictures of a Cybertruck on Mars generated by stable diffusion running on dojo. So I'm gonna end my video on this particular image. I think this is really, really critical to understand. Again, I talked about this previously, but what he's talking about is that they were able to download code that's in PyTorch, standard PyTorch, off of GitHub. They were able to get it running on multiple tiles on Dojo within minutes, and then it was able to produce these results. I The one thing they didn't tell us was how fast they did it. I'd really love to know, because it takes me like 60 seconds to run this on my own computer. I have a feeling with Dojo, it's down in the millisecond range or perhaps even shorter than to do that, to be able to run this on. So again, this is just an inference engine. It's not a training engine. They're not training it. They're using the weights that are already out of the box, but it would be really fascinating to find out just how fast this thing ran. And of course, he talks later on about how they could optimize it and make it a little bit better. But the important point at this point is that this is all just running out of the box and nobody has to do anything special. The beautiful work that's been done by the hardware and the compiler and the ingest and the infrastructure teams, all of those groups of people together is almost miraculous. And it makes me so excited for the future, not just of Tesla, but also AI and training in general. All right, I hope you enjoyed this rather long-winded and geeky presentation and found it fun and interesting and thought-provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. And again, don't forget, on Friday, I will be down in Florida on the Space Coast for TeslaCon in Florida. So come say hi to me if you're there. And in the meantime, and of course, if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch check out our merch store link is in the description we have tesla bot t-shirts the tesla meme t-shirt success is a possible outcome 4680 battery cells all of that stuff is on t-shirts mugs tumblers and on and on so check it out and for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And one other thing for my Patreon patrons and anybody else who's in the Florida area, I'm going to be down at TeslaCon Florida on October 21st and 22nd. So definitely come say hi to me if you're in the area. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a Powerwall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.